right, there's some people streaming in. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Biodiversity Museum Day uh, webinar. Um, it's this year, it's our 10th anniversary of doing Biodiversity Museum Day, but instead of one focused day, we're doing month long talks and activities and pre recorded videos. And um, we're very excited to have um, Phil Ward, professor of entomology at UC Davis, talking to us today. As we're letting people kind of stream in, um, what I'm going to ask you to do, um, the way this is going to work as a Q&A in a webinar is you'll see a button at the bottom of your screen that says Q&A. If you press on that, you can type in your question. You can also click a little um, square in there and you can do ask the question anonymously if you would prefer. Otherwise, we'll see the screen name that you're sharing um, you're going to share with us. So right now, if everyone could do me the favor and just try that out, we don't know where you're coming from. And this could be, you know, broadcast around the world. So if you want to just type in maybe the city you're coming from, the state, the country, um, just give us a little heads up about um, who's joining us today. That would be fun. So if you could try the Q&A option at the bottom of your screen and just type in where you're coming from. And you can do this anonymously if you would prefer. All right, thank you. We have San Jose, Sacramento, Virginia, Big Stone Gap, Virginia. Fabulous. All right, does that's <laughs> we have some friends, <laughs> friends at the Bohart Museum. Hi, Socrates. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, thank you for doing that. And, and then you all got to see how the Q&A works. And so as we answer them, um, they will be answered live. Um, so Phil will be talking and then we'll um, shunt it back to you so you can see the question. So that's how the Q&A is going to work today. Um, one other thing, um, this is um, one of our last seminars. Uh, there's two more um, on Tuesday. Chris Casey at the Honeybee Haven is going to be doing sort of a Q&A about uh, bees in your backyard, particularly in California. Um, and then on Wednesday, Ernesto Sandoval with the Botanical Conservatory is going to be giving a virtual tour of the conservatory in Spanish. Um, so those are the um, two other events coming up. And then we have a whole host of pre-recorded um, videos. There's some fabulous ones about nematodes and millipedes and bees. Um, I'm saying the entomological ones because of this crowd, but there's also wonderful things on yeast and anthropology and many other uh, natural history subjects like wildlife. Um, so please go there. There's activities for kids, storybook reading, coloring books as well. Um, the last thing is we are crowdfunding. Um, UC Davis has um, allowed us to crowdfund for this special month. So if you have been enjoying these events or if you've enjoyed Biodiversity Day, you know, the past nine years, we would appreciate any contributions you could um, send us. Um, $5 is the minimum, it can go up. Um, and these funds are gonna be used to support our next event when it can be live, when it's safe to do so. Um, and it's also supporting um, summer um, education outreach projects for students. Um, so they'll be doing videos and educational materials that the whole world will benefit from. So if you can um, spare a little money, we would appreciate that. And I'll, there'll be a slide at the end of the talk um, that shows you the website for that. So further ado, I don't wanna take any more of your time. I wanna introduce Phil Ward. Um, as I said, he's a professor here at UC Davis in entomology, and he is a world expert on ants. Um, his graduate students gave us a talk last Saturday, perhaps some of you were there, um, but we are thrilled that he is taking some time on um, today to talk to us all about ants. So Phil, please. Okay, uh, thank you, Tabitha, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, everyone, depending on where you are. Um, this is, is, as Tabitha says, a Q&A session, so I don't have a long prepared speech for you about ants. I have a brief introduction about maybe a few slides, and then from then on, I'll just basically be here to answer your questions about ants. Okay, so we'll start a few with a few slides just to sort of provide you with an intro to the world of ants, um, and then I'll take questions after that. So let's see if we can 
screen share here. There we go. But okay. Um, so um, ants are pretty amazing creatures. They are um, one of the most successful of all groups of what we call social insects. So um, what I mean by that, oh, let me just get this organized here, um, is that ants um, live in colonies um, that have a particular particular characteristics that, that, that um, um, give them that, uh, that quality of being social. Um, they, co they, they take care of the brood in a cooperative manner, the young in a cooperative way. They have overlapping generations. And what's most critical about the kind of social behavior that ants show along with social bees, social wasps and termites is that there is a division of labor where most individuals do not reproduce. That's the, the job of the queen uh, and the labor is carried out largely by non-reproductive individual, individuals called workers. So a typical ant colony then has a queen or several queens um, and large numbers of non-reproductive workers that carry out the, uh, the labor of the colony. They collect food, they bring it back, they look after the larvae, uh, they clean out the nest, they defend the nest and so forth. So you can think of an ant colony, although it comprises many individuals, as being something like a super organism, a very well integrated set of individuals um, that are uh, have complex systems of communication and division of labor, and um, and that create this smoothly running operating machine, the, the ant colony. So ants um, originated about 120 million years ago. Um, so they've been around for quite a long time, since the time of the dinosaurs, in fact. Um, a period we call the early Cretaceous. And since that time, um, they have um, diversified, evolved, um, and created, um, evolved into about what we think are 20,000 species today. That's just an approximate number because um, um, we haven't discovered or named all the ant species. So 20,000 species. So, you know, when we speak of ants, it isn't as if we can talk about the habits of the ant or the role of the ant or what the ant does. There are many different kinds of ants and they have many different ecologies and behaviors and habits. So when we speak of ants, we, we speak of them in, in, in the plural. <laughs> there are many different kinds. They're all behaving in different, very different, various different ways. And moreover, ants have colonized um, almost the en entire world, um, much of the entire terrestrial world. Most uh, land surfaces of the globe um, have ant colonies. There's a few places they're absent. They're not in Antarctica, no surprise. Uh, they haven't colonized the Arctic and a few very high elevation tropical mountains. But apart from that, almost any place you go on land, you'll, you'll see our friends, the ants. And they have assumed a, quite a diverse um, array of ecological roles. Some of them are, are predators, others are scavengers, some are seed collectors um, and and these habits um, vary tremendously among different species and in different parts of the world. You can see some examples of some of those things here. Predatory um, bulldog ant in Australia here. Another group of ants here called the leaf cutter ants that are actually herbivores. They cut leaves, vegetation, take it back to the nest and culture fungi with the, with the leaves that they gather. Uh, here's a seed harvesting ant on the far upper right here. There's an ant nest there made of carton, a chewed uh, a carton. Uh, another predatory ant, and another seed harvesting ant. The other interesting thing about ants is that many other kinds of organisms have um, developed relationships with ants, what we would call symbioses, close-knit relationships, closely tied relationships with ants. Um, some of these relationships are mutually beneficial, as for example, um, the tending of certain insects by ants um, insects like aphids or these uh, membracids over here, these are kind of plant bug, that release a sweet substance um, from the rear of their body called honeydew, um, which provides nutrition to the ants, and in return the ants protect their, these, uh, these insects that they tend. Um, so there's, there's mutualistic relationships between ants and other organisms, and sometimes they're not always mutualistic. There are various kinds of insects that have learned to live in ant colonies, and prey upon the brood. So this beetle over here on the top far right is an example of that kind of symbiosis where um, it's a beetle that smells like the ant, 
Um, it's got various protection, uh, chemical and physical protections, and it lives inside the ant nest and feeds upon the ant larvae. So a variety of different relationships have developed between ants and other organisms from, uh, from one-celled organisms like bacteria to many multicellular uh, creatures. Um, the importance of ants. Uh, it is true that some ants are quite serious economic pests. Um, so if you've ever visited or lived in the southeast, you know that the fire ant is a major pest in that part of the world. It's a species introduced into the southeastern United States from South America. And it's a, it's a, a, a serious stinging ant that affects agricultural operations and is also a pest around homes as well. Um, so, so we certainly have, and many ants um, will tend aphids and, and thereby, or other honeydew producing insects, and thereby reduce the value of crops. So we have ant pests, certainly, and we need to think about ways to control them. But it's also true that many ants are beneficial to us. They serve as what we might call biological control agents, um, preying upon eating other kinds of insects that would otherwise uh, compete with us. So it's, it's a two-sided coin. Um, some ants are pests, some ants are very beneficial to us. Moreover, ants um, are themselves like little um, chemical factories. They have all kinds of glands in their bodies that produce various chemicals, often used for communication. And some of those chemicals turn out to be uh, useful uh, pharma for have useful pharmaceutical um, uh, applications for humans. So there's a, and then finally, of course, in addition to all these to these uh, factors, ants are just important ecologically because they aerate the soil um, and they serve basically as nature's um, uh, garbage collectors. Basically, they scavenge large quantities of organic material that otherwise might um, not be picked up. So a huge diversity of ants um, uh, and all around the globe. Here in California alone, we have about 300 species of ants. Um, in the tropics is where ant diversity really um, booms. Ants are members of a group we call the Hymenoptera. So the Hymenoptera is the, is the term for a, a collection of diff different kinds of insects that are usually given the, the, the vernacular terms ants, bees, and wasps. So ants are basically related to bees and certain kinds of wasps. And some of the Ants' closest relatives are shown on this slide here, uh, the cockroach wasp, the mud dauber, and, and also bees like the honeybee. Those are close living relatives of the ant. So ants evolved from wasp-like creatures uh, back 120 odd million years ago. But they, they've diverged from wasps in that they now have a worker caste, um, that is a wingless worker caste, um, and, um, and live in these long lasting colonies. Um, and finally, um, I think my second, my last slide, and then I'll get to some of these questions. Um, ants, of course, have a caste system because they have this set of non-reproductive individuals. Um, a given ant colony will contain workers, queens, and, and at certain times of the year, males as well. And this slide just shows some examples of different um, kinds of workers, a male and queen, um, of one species on the left and a different species on the right. So that's a, a key feature of ant societies. Um, most females become workers, they're non-reproductive, only a few individuals become queens and reproduce. There are many more things I could say in, in, in this talk about ants, but I'm going to limit it just to literally this few minutes because I want to basically field questions from you for most of this hour-long period. So I think that's my last slide. There's just another bit of information about the uh, Davis, UC Davis Biodiversity Museum Day that Tabitha has been um, spearheading. Um, you can go to these websites to um, see the information about the live talks and the pre-recorded talks. And, uh, and we also encourage you to consider uh, the crowdfund site and supporting us for future, for future activities of this kind. So that's all I'm gonna say in the way of introduction. I have a few other slides I can bring up if we need to, to answer questions, but I'm gonna um, stop sharing now and, um, and see what questions we have. And, um, and let's have a conversation about ants rather than just a monologue. Okay, so someone here asks, can you talk about more, um, can you talk some about how ants communicate chemically? I read somewhere that almost all of this, and almost all species, plants as well as animals, fungi, question mark, communicate chemically except humans. Um, yeah, it's true that ants, uh, like many other creatures, um, uh, communicate um, largely by chemical and tactile means. So ants, of course, typically have eyes, they have, they can see things, but their vision is not particularly astute, acute, excuse me, acute. Um, and so, in fact, um, chemical communication uh, via chemicals we call pheromones is really critical in ants. So, um, 
the ants will lay, for example, when they discover food, they will lay a trail pheromone from the source of food back to the nest. And this tells other workers from the nest, there's food along this trail somewhere, follow the trail of chemical trail to the source of food and start bringing it back to the nest. If the nest is breached, um, if they're being attacked in some fashion, they have what we call alarm pheromones. And workers that are detecting that breach will release into the air these volatile chemicals and that causes other workers to start reacting defensively. Um, there are chemicals on the bodies of ants uh, that tell them whether they are fellow nestmates or not, uh, chemicals called hydrocarbons. And the ants can detect these. They have numerous uh, uh, sensilli or hairs that have sen are sensory detectors. And if they antenate another ant, they can tell whether that ant comes from their nest or not, depending upon whether it has the, it has the smell of that ant nest. So, um, so yeah, there's just a, a massive amount of chemical communication and it's probably, you'd say it's more prominent even than visual. Um, and the other major one is tactile. They, they are always antenating each other, um, but that's tied in with chemical communication. So I'll, 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 I'll leave that at, at that for now because uh, there's a bunch of other questions coming in. Great questions. So I think we've done with that question. Um, okay, um, another question is, um, um, what is the ant family with the most species in it? Um, so it turns out that, as I mentioned, ants are members of this group called the order Hymenoptera. And in fact, all ants belong to one family, uh, the Formicidae. So ants themselves comprise one family within the order Hymenoptera. But of course, um, those of us who classify ants, and that's what I do, my specialty is called systematics or taxonomy, have divided the ant family into a bunch of different subfamilies. Those are sort of major groupings of ants um, that contain anywhere from a, from, a few, from a few species to thousands of species. Um, and among those subfamilies then, there's one called the Myrmicini. Um, and these guys are the most diverse. They probably have about 8,000 odd species. Um, so um, another question following up on the chemical uh, communication question, a pheromone is like an odor. Yes, that's right. A pheromone is an odor. It's a volatile chemical that ants can detect with these uh, uh, sensilli, with the, the setae, with the, the, these nerves that are in their setae that can detect um, chemicals. Okay, another question. When I collect insects at lights in the California, Arizona desert, well, that's a fun activity. Um, I often get legionary or driver ant males, but I've not seen or recognized any workers around during the day. Can you elaborate on their presence or habits? Great question. Um, army ants uh, or legionary ants as they're also called, um, are a fascinating group of ants. Uh, I could spend an hour talking about those alone. So this is a group of ants we call army ants or legionary ants. Um, they, have, they form massively large colonies. They go out and forage in large numbers and they, they're the sort of famous army ants of the tropics that were the, provide the grist for, for, the, for the mill, if you like, of these sort of B-grade Hollywood movies that show ants attacking humans and taking over the world. Those are typically army ants or ants with army ant-like behavior. Now the males of those army ants uh, have wings and they fly. And this, this questioner is right. They, um, they, they often come to lights. So you often in a given area like the deserts of California or Arizona, if you're putting out lights at night to see insects, you'll see the army ant males, but you won't see the army ants. Um, they're out there um, and they tend to be around um, not so much during the day, but at night, they often are nocturnal, especially the ones in desert areas. So if you go at night and you scan the, the ground with your flashlight, and if you're lucky, you may encounter these army ants. Um, they occur all the way up to central California. So in the foothills near Davis here, for example, in midsummer, go out on a hot summer's night, you have an opportunity to see army ant, the army ant workers that are out foraging um, as, as opposed to the males that come to light. Okay, so that's, that's the army ant question. Next uh, question um, comes, what is the reasoning behind why ants are you social? I, you, what is kin selection? Okay, so um, that's a very deep and tough question. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning of this brief spiel I gave, um, ants are social, they live in colonies, and most individuals don't reproduce, right? So if you think about it, this poses a bit of a, a conundrum, um, because how can evolution, which occurs by natural selection, which favors, favors reproductive capacity, how can evolution produce individuals that don't reproduce? How can it, how can it produce a social insect with most individuals not reproducing. And the solution to this puzzle has been um, 
the proposed solution to this puzzle is something called kin selection, um, which argues that individuals can pass on their genes in different ways. One way is to directly reproduce, that's the sort of standard natural selection. But another way you could help to pass on your genes is through assisting your relatives to reproduce. And that is the sort of favorite explanation for how it is that ants and social bees and social wasps and termites became social. Individuals that would otherwise have reproduced um, suppressed their own reproduction in order to help their mother produce more offspring. Because that's really what happens with ants. A typical ant colony is founded by Mother Queen. Her first offspring are the, these young workers. Instead of trying to reproduce themselves, they assist mom in producing more offspring. And if their assistance to the mom is particularly efficacious, if they're particularly effective at helping their mother reproduce, then they can pass on their genes through their mom, even though they don't reproduce themselves. And that will include passing on genes that favor such helping or altruistic behavior. So that's the basic idea of how kin selection works. It favors altruistic or helping behavior um, and that that is genetically controlled and that behavior spreads and becomes more common if the helping behavior is effective in, in assisting relatives that carry the same genes um, pass on those genes to their own to their offspring, i.e. the queen and others. So that's a kind of a long-winded answer to your to that question, which was an excellent one. Um, next one, I know ants were sent to the space station. How did they adapt to weightlessness? Well, um, another good question and you know, I don't know the answer to that question. I have to say, just I mean, just by way of an excuse here, that my you know my field is um, is the evolution of ants, the classification of ants, what are the different kinds of species of ants, how are they related to each other. I'm not an expert on ant physiology um, or behavior, so of course I'm fascinated by those things, but I can't say that I would have expertise. And so this sounds like a sort of an ant physiology question. You know, how would the ants react to the situation which they're weightless and how would they adapt to that i could speculate that you know um ants have um at the end of their feet they have tar uh, the section of the feet called uh, well, the foot called a tarsus and those tar at the end of the tarsus are hooks and between the hooks is a, is a pad that has an adhesive structure an adhesive function so i would guess that by virtue of having these um sticky legs if you like legs with hooks and pads at the tip but that would at least enable them to not float off into the fleet in, in the cabin in the, in the space station. But beyond that, I'm not sure how they how they adapted to that to that challenge. Uh, the next question is: Can we smell ant pheromones? Um, yeah, that's a, another good question that I'm not 100% sure about. Certainly, um, not as well as the ants. That's kind of a, a cop out, I guess, to say that because. Because these are these are chemicals that are designed to be uh, detected well by ants. Um, you know, I've put my nose to the ground around ants a lot, and I can detect some things they produce, like when they spray formic acid. You can smell that. I'm not. Sh I don't know if I can really detect um, the pheromones. The pheromones are produced in small quantities, and they're typically volatile. People have synthesized the pheromones uh, artificially in order to do experiments with them. And my suspicion is, you know, if you if you synthesize the pheromone and you were to take a, a waft of a of a flask full of it, you probably would get some odor there. Uh, but I don't know much more beyond that. Okay, uh, the next question says, "Thanks for your introductory talk. You're welcome, Socrates." Um, and the question is, "What are your thoughts on chromatogaster ants being kleptoparasitized by flies? For example, Malachia flies, Ford flies, and Malaya mosquito." Are these ants more vulnerable to trophallaxis-based parasitism? Um, so um, this question has a lot to unpack in it too, I think, like some of the other questions. Um, um, so, it, so let me just explain what trophallaxis is since that's in the question. So, so trophallaxis is the exchange of, of, of liquids between, between uh, individual members of an ant colony. Um, Many ant workers will uh, gather liquids in their crop, uh, like honeydew, for example, or, or you know, sweet liquids, and then regurgitate these liquids to other nest mates or to larvae, or the larvae can regurgitate to adults. So this regurgitation of liquid foods from the crop to other individuals in the ant colony 
is called trophallaxis. And you know, typically a worker may come back from foraging her, her crop, first part of her stomach full of say honeydew or, or liquid, some liquid treat, and then she'll come back to the nest and she will be um, solicited for some of that food from by her nestmates. They'll antenate her. And um, I guess if they smell right, if they perform the right antenation, she will regurgitate some of that food to her nestmates. Or if the larvae, if she detects the larvae being particularly hungry, she will regurgitate um, food to the larvae. Um, other insects can possibly break this code or use this social code to break in and solicit um, food from the ants. Now, I know this is true of beetles that live in ant nests. Certain specialized beetles are able to smell like other ants in the nest and perform uh, physical actions and, and movements that induce the ants in the nest to, to regurgitate to them, to basically feed them. So, you know, there are classic images of this, classic photos or drawings of ants regurgitating to the special beetles that live in ant nests. Now, this question asks, I think, if I'm getting it correctly, whether um, certain ants, in particular one genus called chromatogaster, are susceptible to being um, uh, parasitized that way by certain flies. You know, I was not aware that flies could do that with ants, um, and um, and I don't know much about this topic. Um, but any ant that regurgitates liquids, and 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 not all do, but many ants do this, uh, is potentially susceptible to being parasitized by other insects, right? If they can if they can evolve the right smells and movements and, ac and actions, uh, they could potentially intercept other ants with food in, the, in their crop and get a treat, uh, get a get food regurgitated to them. So that's about as far as I can go on that one. <laughs> um, next question uh, says, the ant's pediole with two projections is unique in Hymenoptera. Any thoughts on why this has developed or how it is an advantage? Yeah, okay, so let's, let's back up and say that between what looks like the ant thorax and what looks like the ant abdomen, there's a there's a joint or either one or two joints. And we call this the, the single joint, the pediole. And if there's two joints between the thorax and the abdomen, we call it a, a post pediole and a pediole. And all ants, virtually all ants, have either a single pediole or a pediole and a post pediole. So these joints between the apparent uh, thorax and the apparent abdomen give great maneuverability to the ant abdomen, right? It can move it around and if it has a sting, it can direct the sting in certain directions. Okay, so that's just background for this question. Um, so the pediole then is this movable joint between the thorax and the, and the, and the abdomen. Now, um, this person says the ant's pediole has two, with two projections is unique in hymenoptera. So sometimes these pedioles are very plain, they're just simple sort of knobby things, but other times they get spikes or spines on them. And I think this individual might be referring to certain ants that have spiny pedioles. Um, and that's developed independently in a number of different ant species. And um, I think the, well, the speculation would be, that this, we would surmise that these spines on the pediole or the pediole and the post pediole of ants are to have a defensive function. That as say predators like birds or lizards attempt to try to eat the ant, the spines will get in the way and they'll make it an unpleasant experience. And those spines, by the way, also often develop on the thorax or the, the middle part of the ant body as well, on, on the front or back part of the, of, the, of the main middle part of the body of the ant. So spininess is quite common in ants, both on the pediole and elsewhere. And the general thinking is that it's, it's serving to protect ants against predators like lizards and birds. And we see this spininess especially de well developed in ants that are foraging on vegetation. So that we, it's consistent with that hypothesis. Uh, next question, even if you could smell it, you probably wouldn't know what it meant. This is, I think, alluding back to ant pheromones, and that's true, of course. We would not interpret these pheromones the way the ants do. They've evolved to interpret them in certain ways. For us, it would just be some kind of funky smell. <laughs> Quite true. Um, next question, we see that ants that appear to be carrying liquid between their mandibles. Yeah, are, usually there are aphids around. The assumption is it's honeydew. Could it be anything else? Do they regurgitate formic acid to put on plants as some uh, species do on, on nests for fungal inhibition? Okay, so this also is a great question with a bunch of different subcomponents to it. Um, yeah, so many ants that collect liquids, like I mentioned, honeydew, let's say, broadly speaking, um, uh, secretions of other insects like aphids or maybe plant nectar, many ants that collect those liquid foods are able to take it into their, into their um, 
and take it in, into their um, elementary tract and store it in their crop. So they don't have to store it between the mandibles. But other ants, um, maybe their crops are smaller, will actually keep that liquid between their mandibles. So they gather the liquid and they, and they, they hold it between their mandibles. Um, it's, it's true of one subfamily of ants that does this a lot. And so in that case, the, the transport is at least in part between the mandibles, not in the, inside the stomach, if you see what I'm saying. And so, yeah, I would say if they've got some liquid between the mandibles, it's probably something like honeydew or, or, or flower nectar. Um, what would they do with that? Um, mostly they would re regurgitate it or pass it back to other nest mates. Um, this, the, the questioner says, could, could they do anything else with that? For example, could they put uh, formic acid on plants as some species do on nests? Um, actually, the formic acid is, is, is ejected through the other end of the body, through the, through the, through the gaster or the abdomen. Um, and it's sprayed out. So formic acid is used in a way to inhibit, uh, to uh, deter enemies, and it has other functions as well. Um, but it would be uh, ejected not through the mouth. Not, it wouldn't come up through the mouth. It goes from a, from the uh, from a gland in the in the gaster in the abdomen out through the end of the abdomen. And uh, and and this person might be maybe had heard about the fact that certain ants use that formic acid to kill other ants in their community. So these are tropical ants that live in specialized ant plants. So some ants, some plants have evolved specialized bodies um, or homes, we call them domatia, for ants to live in. And one of the ants in the tropics that lives in such plant domatia doesn't want other kinds of plants around that don't have these homes. So it'll go down and it'll spray formic acid on the plants that are around that its own favorite plant and thereby keep them down. So that's the use of formic acid to kill plants, but it's coming up out of the abdomen. Um, okay, so I'll move on to another question. Um, what is the evolutionary thinking as to why ants expanded and survive? What are they thinking as to why ants expanded and survive accessing different types of food, i.e., some are predatory, some collect seeds, etc.? Would it be would it be that more of them can survive if they could fill different resource niches in this way. So yeah, I mean, certainly as I emphasized or tried to emphasize in the, in the beginning slides, um, there's no single way that ants, uh, uh, no single lifestyle for ants. Ants collect many different kinds of resources. And I think the general thinking both for ants and for many other kinds of organisms is that um, coexistence is enhanced if, if different species use different sets or subsets of resources. And ants are certainly prime examples of individuals that compete. So, you know, if ecologists are looking for great examples of competition among species, you don't have to look much farther than the different kinds of ants, because ants are really pretty rapacious individuals when they're foraging for food and or defending their nests from other ants. And ant competition can be really intense. So almost certainly over evolutionary time, there was selection to reduce the strength of competition among coexisting ant species. I think this is what the questioner is getting at. And presumably that partly explains this great diversity of feeding habits we see across ants today. I mean, they all evolved, but don't forget, from a single common ancestor. There was a single Ur ant sometime back in the you know, early Cretaceous. That would have had a particular habit. Probably it was predatory, like the related wasps. And from that predatory ancestral ant, we have now this great diversity of feeding habits presumably partly as a result of selection favoring different niches, different feeding habits for different species. Okay, little ants are devilish to mount on paper points, the, uh, says this next questioner. The legs get glued together and their bodies curl into a ball. Surely an ant guy would have some tips on how I can better mount them. Okay, fair enough. This is from the same questioner, I think, who asked about uh, army ants coming uh, in the deserts at night. So this individual I believe might be an insect collector or has, has, has collected insects and has found that preparing ants is difficult. And I, I absolutely agree with you. And you have my sympathy. Many insects, if you're collecting, if you're an insect collector, a larger insect can be pinned directly. It's not a problem. And they easily, if you spread the wings, that's fine, Lepidoptera. Um, but ant collectors can't do that. We don't usually pin our ants because they're too small and slender. So we have to attach the ants the little cardboard points. And this, many entomologists do this for small insects. So small flies, small wasps, ants um, will be not directly pinned by entomologists, but they will be attached to a triangular cardboard point, and then a pin goes through that cardboard point. Okay, so that's the background to this, to this 
for this question. Now, how do you do that? How do you attach a cardboard, the tip of a cardboard point, the tip tapers, of course, to a small tip. How do you attach that to an ant? Um, first of all, you have to do it. I find I have to do it under a microscope. Ants are too small for this to be done macro, you know, macroscopically. Um, so you have to have a microscope of some kind or, or some magnification. Um, and you have to have steady hands. You know, don't drink coffee just before you try to point on ants. Um, and, um, and then you, what helps if you wait for the ant to be a bit stiff so you can move the legs out of the way. So the legs, because the legs often get in the way. The ants curl up and the legs curl up too. So if you can pull those legs away from one another, so the underside of the body is exposed and then try to get that tip of the point on the underside of the body of the ant, then you're getting your ant well now, the ant well prepared for, for, for the insect collection. So that's, and there is a, um, my colleague, um, a colleague of mine in, in Utah, Jack Longino, has a website um, that says, it's, it's something like how to point mount ants. Um, so if you Google Longino, that's L-O-N-G-I-N-O, -O, and how to point mount ants, you'll probably find his much more detailed description of how to do that. Okay, on to the next question. How does the vision of ants compare with other hymenoptera, bees and wasps? Yeah, uh, another great question. Oh, these are all fantastic questions, by the way. May much appreciate them. Um, so ant vision varies tremendously. So I um, wonder if I can go back to one of my share screens and, and just um, let's try to um, look at that a bit. Um, yeah, so uh, let's see examples here. You know, some ants have really big eyes. Let's see if we can light. Well, first of all, it's true that wasps and bees are often rather large eyes. See, so here's the ant relatives. Bees and wasps, they've got big eyes. That's this questioner um, uh, says. The ant eyes tend to be a bit smaller, right? Look at these ants here. Uh, Phil, size. we can't we can't share screen yet. Oh, we can't share screen. Oh, well, uh, we're not. You're not sharing screen. Sorry, Tabitha interrupting. Oh, oh, thank you. Let's see. Share. Thank you. Okay, here we go. Now, can you see it? Yes, we can see it now. Okay, so as this person pointed out, um, you know, relatives of ants like like uh, these wasps you have pretty big eyes, right? And bees often are big eyed. So what about ants? You know, how about them? Their eyes tend to be a bit smaller on average. Look at these um, weaver ants here. And in some ants, like these army ants, their eyes are virtually gone. So the army ant has a little tiny, tiny single faceted eye here, and that's it. Um, so clearly army ants are not using vision much at all. They're using those other senses I mentioned, tactile and sensory. But ants like these weaver ants on top here, can you see my, my uh, cursor moving here? Is that visible, Tabitha? Yes, that is visible. Right. So these uh, weaver ants here, you can see you've got, they've got medium sized eyes. So they probably are using some vision. Uh, they will react to vision. And one of the ants with, with the largest eyes is the bulldog ant of Australia. You can't really see it too well here, but these guys have got, well, let's go to, let's see if we have another. Yeah, well, here's another a big eyed ant. This is a, a, a Ponderan ant from India. See the size there. So basically, ants vary from being big-eyed and probably reasonably effect, uh, having reasonably effective vision, like other wasps, to being virtually blind, like these ants here, these mystery ants. So I'll just, yeah, I'll just stop stop with that. Okay, what is your favorite place to go study ants in nature? Oh my goodness, you know, um, if you're an ant lover like me and my students, uh, we're blessed because ants are as it are almost everywhere. And you know, it's not like there's a single place you can go and look at them. You can you can just go into your backyard. Uh, during you know COVID lockdown, I amused myself for hours just going to my backyard and watching the ants there. You know, I put out baits for them and observe them interact with each other and, and so forth. So even your backyard, honestly, um, I mean it depends where you live, but um, here in Davis, I've got about eight, ten species of ants in my in my yard, including you know pest ants like the Argentine ant, but a few other native ants too. So, you know, first of all, you can study ants or look at ants even in your backyard and, and get pleasure from that if you're, if you're crazy like us, us ant lovers. Um, but also, of course, ants are very abundant and, and usually in, in just natural areas. So here in California, habitats like oak woodland or chaparral um, are just full of ants. Um, now, in the summer here, it gets quite hot and ant activity will be reduced during the day. So you might want to become crepuscular. You might want to become an evening activity person. The ants often will reduce their activity in the day and they'll come out just as, as this towards sunset and, and be very active then. Um, and finally, of course, I mean, if you have the opportunity to get to the tropics, um, to, a, to a 
environmentally friendly country like Costa Rica, wow, that's just paradise for the ant lover because they're just you know thousands of species of ants in a country like Costa Rica, and uh, they're all over the place. They're on vegetation, they're on the ground, they're out at night, they're out at day, um, and you're just in in paradise there. <laughs> okay, do ants ever consume the liquids that emerge from aphid cornicles? As opposed to just the honeydew that comes out of the back of the abdomen. Yeah, I don't think the great question. Um, I think it's just the honeydew that comes out of the back of the abdomen. Um, I I, th I haven't seen them actually getting food from the cornicles. Um, it'd be interesting to look again at that. Remember that animated film, The Ants, where Woody Allen plays a disaffected ant worker and he's he's talking to a shrink. I think at some point or he's going to an ant bar, and they're they're serving up honeydew from from aphids, it'd be interesting to, to look to see if they had that correctly from the from the end of the abdomen of the aphid or whether they use the cornicles. But anyway, I'm, I'm digressing here. I, I don't think they use, I think they get it out of the end of the abdomen, yeah. Um, is ant diversity diminishing in California? I don't see as many species as I used to, for example, in the Central Valley. Yeah, uh, uh, good question, JLW. Um, you've had several now and I appreciate them. Um, yeah, well, Ant diversity is decreasing in parts of California. And um, one of the um, causes of that actually is another ant. So we have an ant in California called the Argentine ant uh, introduced. I mentioned it briefly already, I think. Um, it introduced from South America. Well, no, it was the fire ant. But anyway, another introduced ant from South America besides the fire ant, which is mostly in the Southeast, is the Argentine ant, which is widespread across Southern United States. And the Argentine ant um, is really a pest in sort of urban uh, and some agricultural and disturbed parts of California. Um, you know, if you live in urban areas of California and low, low, light, low elevation urban areas of California, you probably almost certainly encounter the Argentine ant. Um, they form super colonies, which means different colonies don't fight each other. They're all cooperating. And the other downside of Argentine ants is that they tend to eliminate native ants. So over the years that I've lived in Davis, I have certainly noticed that native ants have declined as the Argentine ants have expanded. And they expand not just in, say, urban areas, but along certain natural habitats. And one that they really like is riparian habitat. So if you look along rivers and streams that are near urban areas, they're getting uh, invaded by Argentine ants. And when they do, when they go into those areas, the native ants, most native ants, not all, but most native ants just disappear. They can't, this is a very tough, aggressive ant. And the, the mellow California ants can't handle an aggressive invader from South America. So they just disappear. They're, they go locally extinct, basically. So some of the, de of the decline in ant diversity is because of a very aggressive introduced species, the Argentine ant. Now, it's also true that, of course, habitat habitat loss is the other. So introduced species, that's just as with many other animals and plants, that's one major cause of, of decline in diversity. The other major cause of decline in ant diversity is just loss of good habitat. Um, you know, the native ants in California um, do better where there's good native habitat, unsurprisingly. And so as we, you know, pave over the landscape, um, put houses in what used to be fields or oak woodland or chaparral, of course, that's less suitable habitat for native ants. So the, the conversion that's typically occurring is, you know, there'll be native ants in the chaparral or oak woodlands as we build houses um, and, and colonize those areas. The introduced ants come in and the native ants tend to be pushed out. That's, that's the sad story. So we need to definitely preserve habitat in natural habitat in California uh, for the sake of native ants as, as, as for the whole the entire you know, native flora and fauna. Um, another question um, from the same person, are there some really interesting ants I should look for in the California foothills? Not that, the, not that any are not interesting. Yeah, I get your point. Are there some particularly interesting ones? <laughs> um, and there are. Um, my goodness, um, where to begin? Uh, well, um, first of all, we have some very prominent seed harvesting ants in the California foothills here. Um, and they um, are um, um, prodigious collectors of seeds. There's a sort of blackish one called Vermesser andrei, but it's very common in the foothills um, in what we call oak woodland. Until you, when you get the prominently coniferous forest, it disappears. But in the oak woodlands and the foothills, grasslands, this um, large black seed harvesting ant is quite common. And the nests are conspicuous because they're surrounded by chaff. That is to say, after they collect the seeds, they throw out the chaff, the unusable, inedible parts, and the chaff builds up around the nest entrance. Um, 
And these nests are, if you go into appropriate foothill habitats, the nests are quite common and the chaff builds up enormously over the summer. So at the end of the summer, there's this big pile of chaff around the ant nest. Um, the, there's, a, there's quite a bit of extra nutrients around the, the nests of these ants because the chaff always has some nutrients. And so in the springtime, as plants start to germinate, you often see a particularly luxurious growth of fresh vegetation around these ant nests because of the higher nutritional levels around the nest. So that's one interesting one. Um, army ants, of course, occur here. If you go out at night, you could look for army ants, but you've got, it's a lucky encounter. You have to go out many nights in a row probably to see those. Um, if you, do you know the plant manzanita? Uh, if you do, manzanita is, is a real boon for um, native ants. Again, if you're in a natural area where, without introduced ants, manzanita um, branches harbor several different very interesting ants that will nest in the in, in the branch itself. They, these are basically arboreal ants. Um, and so what happens is the branches of manzanita, if, you, if any of you know this plant, you know that it's, it's a beautiful shrub and it usually involves this intertwining of live maroon colored branches with some dead wood. So a given branch will be a mixture of dead wood and live wood. The dead, dead wood is often bored by beetles and so these holes appear in the dead wood. And then the ants that live in Manzanita will take advantage of abandoned or old beetle borings and move in and have their nests there. But the nests therefore are close to the live tissue and they better survive the summer drought in these dead sections of live branches of Manzanita. So look for ants living in Manzanita. It includes actually a tropical species called Pseudomyrmex, which we normally have to go into Mexico or Costa Rica to see, but there's one member of that genus that has made it up to Northern California and it lives in Manzanita branches. Okay, so there's a couple of examples for you. Army ants, the seed harvesting ants and, uh, and the ants living in Manzanita. There are many more though. Okay, in your estimation, what percentage of ants have yet to be discovered? Have any known ant species gone extinct recently? Yeah, um, thank you again for that question. Um, you know, the number of described ant species is about 14,000. Okay, so that's the number of species of names of ants right now. But all of us who study ants know there's a bunch more than this. And the question is how many more? I gave a conservative estimate, you know, in, when I was uh, sharing slides. Am I still sharing? No, I'm not sharing screen. Um, I gave a conservative estimate of, um, you know, 20,000 species of ants. Um, but, you know, it could well be 30 or 40,000. Um, when we go to, the, especially to the tropics, you know, and really, uh, survey areas in detail, we often find many undescribed species. Um, you know, yeah, and so it could be an order, it could be more like 40 or 50,000 species. Even in California, of the 300 species here, about a couple dozen of them are undescribed. Um, I, there's just not enough time in the day, unfortunately, to work on everything. And so I've got, you know, we've got even in California, some undescribed ants. It's not always easy to tell whether a species is undescribed or not. This is sort of a a, a nuanced aspect of this, which I, I try to convey to the public, that it isn't just a matter of we know that certain number of species are described and then we have to look for undescribed species. The things, the names that have been given to species of ants, we don't fully understand what they mean. And so some of the things that are named species might be synonyms of other things. So some of the names are redundant. Uh, and when we see collections of ants, we can't always easily tell whether a given collection of an ant is an ant that belongs to one of these named species or whether it's undescribed. So it is actually a challenging problem sometimes to determine whether a species is undescribed. Have any known ant species gone extinct recently? Um, well, we don't have, you know, really well-documented cases like the Xerxes butterfly uh, as we have for some other insects like, like the butterfly I just mentioned. Um, it's harder to survey ants than some other kinds of insects. Um, there is an ant that I described um, from um, just north of Davis here, from Oak Woodland. Um, it's a very peculiar um, ant, a tiny little ant, lives in soil and leaf litter, and its relatives are specialist predators on a kind of insect called a springtail. So it's an unusual ant. Anyway, a springtail praying ant that I described as a new species, very distinct, from just north of Davis here, near the town of Woodland. And it's known from nowhere else in the world, and it's never been found since it was collected originally back in the 80s. So that's an example, one that maybe it went extinct. It lives in, in patches of oak woodland in the Central Valley. And we all know that, well, maybe you realize that most of the patches of oak woodland in the Central Valley have been cut and cleared for farm, for 
farmland because it's such good soil. So this was a, a rare piece of just relictual oak woodland in which I found this ant. And it may be that it's winked out because we've not been able to find it for about 20 or 30 years. Um, another question, compared to other insects, ants don't seem very colorful, not even with, re with refractive colors. Any thoughts on why not? Or maybe some are colorful. No, um, you're right, they don't. Um, you know, I, I try to in my, um, let's just uh, put up a, you know, a, a few more, um, let's see, uh, pictures here just to show a bit of color here. So, um, you know, you can see this ant with a nice red head and a bit of rouge in that ant on the left there. Let's see what else we can find in the way of ant color. Well, here's a nice, can you all see this now? Uh, down the bottom here, this sort of metallic, beautiful blue purple ant here, Calamermix from Australia. These ant, the weaver ants have some green in their gaster, in their abdomen. You all see that? So th there is some color, but you're right. I mean, they're not brightly colored. Um, and I guess, um, and it's curious because some of them definitely are warningly colored because ants often can sting or they have nasty chemicals. So it is true that, you know, some ants seem to be warning other predators, you know, don't eat me. Um, and yet they haven't gone all out for full kind of colors you see in Lepidoptera. Part of it, of course, is Lepidoptera have their colors due to their scales that cover their body and ants aren't covered in scales like that. Their hairs are usually very thin and linear, not flattened like, like a butterfly moth scales. So that limits perhaps the opportunity for, for color variety. Um, uh, but anyway, I, I, so I'm not 100% sure, but there are some examples I've shown here of ants that are moderately colorful. Look at this beautiful Calamermix. Um, and the ants I studied for my PhD were, were kind of a purple green color in Australia. Okay, so that's, um, that, that, answered the, that answers that question. Um, and there's no more open questions and we're approaching the end of the hour. So this is kind of a, a wrap up time, I guess. Um, I have to sort of, those of you who are still hanging around here, I'll, I'll thank you for your questions. Um, they were all uh, great questions. I could possibly uh, direct you to other sources of information. If you like um, to get introduced to ants, um, Here's a book that's uh, you know written for the layperson, for the but very well produced. It's called Journey to the Ants. Can you see that by Holdalder and Wilson? I'm very old-fashioned. I'm just holding up a book here rather than um, putting it into some electronic format. But anyway, it's called Journey to the Ants. It's by Bert Holdalder and E.L. Wilson. It's sort of a, a an introduction to ant biology for the layperson, but beautifully written. And then you can graduate to an even larger version of this book, just called The Ants by the same authors. It's a big coffee table-sized book. But it's just spectacular. It's, it's like an encyclopedia of ant biology. So you might start with Journey to the Ants and migrate then later or later step up to the uh, graduate to the, this large, beautiful book called um, The Ants by Holdover and Wilson. There are also ant websites that contain information. Um, there's one called Ant Wiki that many um, people use, uh, another one called Ant Web. Um, so those two are good. Um, and then there are people who like to keep ant colonies. That's a whole other area I haven't talked about today. I, I should, I'm not, I'm not an, I don't keep ants in terraria, but that's a, a very popular hobby these days. And, um, and there's a whole slew of websites devoted to um, the, the culture of ants, if you like. Um, and that's, that's really popular. And, and there's uh, one of the things is called Ants Canada. Uh, I, I'm a chap there who's a, both, a, I think, a a rock star singer or a pop sings in a rock band and also is interested in ants. I forget his name, and he he um, has a has a great website for with tips about keeping ants and and um, so you might want to go there. So, um, if there are no more questions, well, maybe we'll we'll um, we'll say we'll close the close the show. Yeah, yeah, I just wanted to chime in. Um, thank you so much, Phil. That was fascinating and. Yeah, thank you everyone for joining us this morning and asking excellent questions. Um, oh, and thank you. Someone just, <laughs> just said thanks. It's been great. Yeah, um, thank you, folks. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, and I'll just repeat that this is part of the Biodiversity Museum month this year because it's virtual. Um, and there are two more talks that will be live in Q&A in this format. Um, again, on Tuesday uh, about honeybees and the um, and native bees as well in, in gardens, um, given by Chris Casey over at the Hagen-Dazs Honeybee Haven. And then on Wednesday, Ernesto Sandoval, the director of the UC 
Davis Botanical Conservatory is giving a, um, a virtual tour of the Botanical Conservatory, which does involve a lot of, you know, um, insect, plant insect interactions. His talk is um, very rich in that manner, um, but it will be in Spanish. So um, you can practice your Spanish or if you are a native speaker, you can enjoy that um, conversation and that Q&A. Um, and I will pitch one more time the crowdfund. Uh, it's a UC Davis crowdfund. Um, and Biodiversity Museum Day is raising money um, for our two things, our next live in-person event. Usually this is a, a big fun day event here on campus. And we invite everyone for this free, you know, all ages event. Um, but we didn't have it this year for COVID. So we're fundraising for the next opportunity to do that. And then the second part of it is fundraising for um, graduate and undergraduate um, uh, opportunities to do some science education and communication. So producing videos and educational content um, for all 12 museums participating. So sort of this pan uh, collections um, experience uh, that will you know, benefit everyone. So please, if you can spare some money, we know it's uh, challenging times. Um, we would appreciate that all right well thank you very much phil i'm going to sign off okay. this, is, this, has, this has been recorded um and okay. we will, we for, will posterity. Get, <laughs> for posterity um so we will get this posted on the biodiversity website which is biodiversitymuseumday.ucdavis.edu okay thanks for the opportunity tabitha it was fun you're welcome thank you everyone Bye. have a great day